doing all this work and then the result only represents a small percentage of the population. How useful is that? Is that not a waste of time? It needs to be representative of the population that you serve or the population that it affects. How can you celebrate success when it's not representative? It's about reaching those populations who in the past have not engaged with research because we're not accommodating their lifestyle. We appreciate having every race, but we need to reach the average man. So that's the man in the street who's sweeping or that's the cleaner on the night shift. If you have individuals who often are in the service industry or on zero contracts where if they don't work, they don't get paid, they're not going to take part. So we need to alter how we're working, offering a focus group in the afternoon as well as in the evening. Transportation, reimbursement for childcare for these participants if we really want to engage these communities. Because what happened in the past why there's this lack of representation, there's this lack of data on diverse communities is because we had a one size fits all approach. We need to have a mixed method approach. The NHS gallery trial is looking to see if a new blood test for 50 different types of cancer could work at the population level. We lose a COVID scale number of people to cancer every year and when you want to show the sort of impact that we want to show at a population scale you have to have enough what's called statistical power in the study so we calculated that we needed 140,000 people but there have been very few trials of this sort of scale ever in the world that's an enormous number of people but we also wanted to make sure that we enrolled a population that was representative of the population at large so that we can indeed generalize when we're thinking about how such a program might be rolled out. And probably the most significant of all of those is the socioeconomic deprivation issue because we know there's both higher incidence of cancer in those communities but also higher morbidity and mortality from cancers. The other thing that we were keen not to do was to burden the NHS. We decided the best way to do this was not to ask people to come into their GP practice or to go to a hospital, but actually to go to them. So we developed a whole fleet of mobile clinics, put them in supermarket car parks or football stadia car parks, go out into more rural communities or inner city communities, bring the research to the people rather than asking people to come to the research. And that proved immensely powerful. We were also very targeted in the way we approached certain communities. We engaged with faith groups and community leaders, advertised on local and indeed foreign language radio stations. People were really delighted, first of all, to be invited. Many people who participated in this study had never been invited to participate in research before. It's definitely hard work, but you can do it. And it's worth it because you get better results at the end of it. If you think about the way we structure healthcare around the world, we ask people to come to us. As we look to the future, we're going to need to develop more and more solutions where we go to where people are. And we can do that now. We have the capability, we have the expertise, we have the experience, we have the technology available to make it easier for people to access healthcare. And research is one part of that. Trials at Home is studying how we can decentralise research, finding ways to take it out of the lab and into the real world. We should be wary of seeing the way we always do trials as synonym to that's the best way to do trials because the world is really changing. So I think for our research really to stay current and also to stay impactful, we have to change along with the changing times. The radial trial is measuring a diabetes treatment, but the goal isn't just about understanding diabetes. It's about understanding how clinical research might work in the future. 
Radial really is a different study than most clinical trials because all participants will get the same clinical intervention, but we have three arms with three different operational approaches, so with a different level of decentralization. First arm, these people are followed up in a conventional way. So they come to site to see whether they're eligible. They come to site for their measurements and they get some phone calls in between. Second arm is a hybrid arm where they come to site for their eligibility, but then they're followed up remotely where home nurse and also technology play a part. And then the last, which is the most innovative arm, is a fully decentralized arm. So they, these participants never actually come to site. They get all their equipment at home in a box and they're guided through how they should be started on the trial. They talk to the physician and staff through teleconferencing, putting data in an app, but also by using technology that automatically records how much of their medication they use. I actually got interested in the centralized clinical trial approaches because I was interested in real world evidence or more pragmatic trials because we see if you have a very strictly controlled trial, people behave differently than they do in real life. So then sometimes what you find in the trial actually is not reflective of how that intervention would work in real life. And if you do your trial decentralized and people are in their own home environment doing measurements by themselves, you may tackle some of those issues and you may get more real world results on how an intervention actually works. I think decentralization of clinical trials is here to stay and I think it's an important development, but it's not the answer for all clinical trials that are there. I'm a big believer that if we don't do research about research, then we just get stuck in the ways we always do things. We lose touch with the real world. Without that, I don't think we have as much innovation in clinical care as we actually need. So we need to be smart about our research. We, and by we, I mean medical establishment in high income countries have traditionally assumed that we understood cancer genetics because of things like the Cancer Genome Atlas. But that is mostly white Western European heritage group of patients whose tumors have been sequenced. And that's not cancer genetics. That is the genetics of, of that population. There are a number of things that I'm seeing that is different from what we are reading in the textbook. That's actually the problem we have in this part of the world. A number of people adopting uh, guidelines from high income country without piloting those guidelines in this part of the world. Just taking high income country data and applying it in Nigeria and starting a program without studying it there would really affect both patients and the healthcare system in a negative way. And I think that's a lesson for almost all low middle income country. We all, as a scientist, we have to be on our toes and we must test everything, test every water before we start drinking it to change the practice in our environment. Everything uh, has to be done in a collaborative way with real leadership from the low middle income country. Isaac led a study investigating the unique needs of Nigerian cancer patients and the implications for their treatment. One question we had in Nigeria is, since more than 50% of patients were walking in the door with stage four disease, very advanced disease, what's a realistic way that we can help cure more patients today? And it's find them earlier. Isaac led us in a study just looking at some common symptoms, things like bleeding from your rectum, and paired that with losing weight and a change in how stool looked. And we made a risk model and we studied that in three cities and found there was a massive shift in the stage of presentation of the cancer. Instead of 50 to 60% stage four, it was 20 to 25% stage four, which is a huge shift in stage. If the results we showed were from a drug, that's a New England Journal of Medicine paper, a Lancet paper that is on the New York Times. So, I mean, the, the results were pretty dramatic and it's a small study and we're trying to repeat it at a larger scale in the country. But it's a good example that, you know, you don't have to have a, a three million dollar intervention to have a, a meaningful improvement in patient outcomes. One thing that we adopted right from the beginning is that not only that we get the data, but we train the locals on how can we improve the capacity of the local researcher to be able to do a lot of work on their own. This is the best model that should be adopted by anybody 
not only be interested in their career, but interested in the people and uh, interested in changing the practice, leaving the environment better than they met it. A friend of mine said lately that the next discovery in the cancer space is likely going to be from low middle income country. And there are a number of people that are interested in working with high income country partners to make new discovery that can change practice. So we need you, you need us. The partnership can move the world, make the world a better place for everybody. Involving patients in the research process both creates a more engaged participant group and helps researchers to design studies that are more likely to make a difference. PPIE, it stands for Patient and Public Involvement and Engagement, involving the patient's voice in every stage of the research cycle. I think in the past there was a lot of tokenistic tick box exercise, but I think we were definitely moved on since then. Having a discussion with patients, getting their views on what matters to them and how we should conduct our research, whether that's design, whether that's prioritization, it's about hearing how the patients feel about what you're doing. I think we need to be very wary of thinking we know what trial participants want, but we need to talk. For trials at home, we set up a patient expert panel to think along in all the stages, what do we really want to research? What is important? They came up with things that we didn't even think about. There were discussions on a home nurse visit. It sounds ideal, but some people say, I don't want someone in my home. We shouldn't have those assumptions, but we should test them. Costas Tagalos is on the Trials at Home patient expert panel. We were equal part of the team. Our opinion was respected, our opinion was heard. We were asked to contribute in reviewing documents, reviewing processes and uh, participating in meetings so that the project was to be tailor-made to the needs and wants of diabetes persons. Trials at Home is a research that is bringing in the research to the far end of each country to the islands, to the rural people, to the people living in the mountains, far away from hospitals or research centers. So we wanted to make sure that the technology that was supposed to be used could be easily used by all the people in this project. We believe that by contributing to this project, we would make it more valuable to the diabetes community and uh, to be honest, we are expecting that the results of this uh, project will be beneficial uh, in the near future, even to us. Many people participate in research because they want to help others. Um, and we don't always tell them how they achieved that. We don't always report back. And so finding ways of, of providing that information back to people, I think can be a really important way both to respect one of the reasons why they might have participated, you know, potentially encourage more participation in the future. Let's not just let it sit in a journal. How about we go into the community and share our findings? We used to have a relatively patronising attitude in medical research where we just expected people to come along. We were doing it for their good. And now I think we recognise much more that people are making a donation of their time above all else. They're making a donation of their data. In our case, they're making a donation of their blood. It is really important to think about how we can make the experience for individuals, if not enjoyable, at least something they find interesting, that they are being acknowledged and, and appreciated for what they're doing. Research should be available to everyone. And we have a duty to make that the case. In this, our 200th year, we draw attention to research for health as a critical health issue. To drive progress, we have two asks. 